Welcome, Heritage Baptist family and friends. I'm glad to see you today. I hope that all is going well for you. The Wagners are doing well also, and I'll share a little bit more about that in just a moment. We find ourselves back doing these recorded services. I hope that this helps you today to worship the Lord and to learn from his scriptures. Let's begin with the song, The Wonderful Cross. I have a few announcements that I'd like to share with you. Uh, we got off the phone today with Alice Bainham. Some of you know that she gave us a request about her son, Mark, and we wanted to pass some details on to you about him. He did have surgery and was able to have a mass removed from his brain. Now he's still in a coma because he still has a few other issues going on. For instance, he has a blood clot on his lung and he's suffering with pneumonia. So do pray for him and pray for Alice. I know that they need comfort and are asking that the doctors would have wisdom in how to treat this. Uh, Marge Schreiner has begun her radiation and actually has had several treatments. And they tell us that things are going well, but there's still more treatments to go. So pray for them, especially as they're driving and hoping that it uh, works well in her body. Heather Hunt 
we talked to her and she is having some heart issues yet. So I do pray for her and pray for Bruce and just ask that they would have wisdom and would have success in treating this and finding the right medications and so forth for them. Now, we've also given you some prayer requests for Lynn's family. I'd like to remind you of a couple of those. Her grandma, Herwire, is in a nursing home, and actually right now she's in hospice care because she's dealing with COVID. So do pray for her. That's a serious situation. Her brother, Tim, as some of you know, had gone into the hospital. He's now home, and he's doing better, and we thank you for praying for him. And then her uncle, Harlan, had COVID earlier, just a few weeks ago, and he's now over that, but he's got other issues going on. So now he finds himself in the hospital again. And Lynn would just like you to pray for these things. Thank you for doing that. Now you've been praying for the Wagner family as we've been going through COVID. I will say this, we'll have stories for you to share of a number of different things that has happened to us as we've done that. But one of the things that's really stood out to us is the care that you've given to us. I know there's been several of you that have come by and dropped off meals. Thank you for just dropping them on the porch and then allowing us to uh, come out and get them after you've left. I must admit, we feel like some of the lepers in the Old Testament that have to walk around shouting, unclean, unclean. But we thank you uh, for the food. Uh, one of the things of COVID is that you can lose your sense of smell and your sense of taste. We've certainly done that, but I will say this, the meals and the food that you've brought to us have been very good. Uh, Jill Snyder has helped Lynn and I realize that even without your sense of taste, a ooey gooey brownie is still very good. So thank you very much for those of you that have uh, brought things to us and dropped things off. Thank you. We do appreciate that. I would also like us to uh, take a moment and pray, and let's pray for our country. Now that the elections are over, we've got to move forward, and we know that we want a land to live in that is peaceful, where we can have peaceable lives, and we can still carry out the ministries that the Lord Jesus has left for us to do as Christians in the United States. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask him to help us with those things. Father, thank you for caring for us. Thank you for meeting our needs. Uh, Lord, we think of Alice Bainham and their family and what they're going through with her son, Mark, right now. And we ask that you'd give them peace. We ask that you'd give them uh, strength. And we pray that you'd give him physical strength so that he can endure these things and still come out on the other side and, and be able to resume his life in a normal way. Uh, just bless them and uh, help Alice, Lord, as she can't do much to be there with them. Uh, just bless her and uh, give her uh, wisdom in how to uh, uh, tackle this situation from here on out. Father, we uh, thank you for helping with Lynn's family and all the different things that have been happening there. We think especially with her grandma Herwire and her, her uncle Harlan and brother Tim, and just pray, Lord, you help all of them to be able to uh, heal up from these things and be able to recover. Um, Lord, we thank you for uh, helping Marge Schreiner as she's gone through these uh, radiation treatments. And we just pray that they'd be effective and that uh, she would be able to recover from this and, and ask that you keep them safe as they're doing a lot of driving back and forth. And then for the hunts, Father, uh, we know that Heather's been dealing with these heart issues for a long time. And we pray that you would uh, give them grace to continue and to endure. And we pray that uh, they'd be able to find solutions and be able to help her as she tries to manage these conditions. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, um, help us in our country. Uh, as Christians, help us to continue to have a, a presence, have a, a testimony of the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for those of us here in the Grayling area. We, we want to have a testimony. We want to be able to show people that you are at work in our lives and that uh, they need to consider the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd help us to see people turn to you for salvation, but also, Lord, to see believers turn to you for help in walking out their lives of faith. Uh, use us, Lord, as we try to help minister in that way. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing another song together, this time the song, Worthy of Worship.
before we had to cancel church again this time, we were studying the book of Ephesians. And we're, we're looking at Paul's message to the church in Ephesus on, first of all, he was given theological truths about their salvation. And then the last half of the book is practical. Practical. How do you live out your faith now because of these truths? And we find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 6. And that's where I'd like to begin today. In fact, I want to go back and read a portion of this. Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 13. Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. We've tried to remind ourselves that we are in a spiritual battle and that Satan does want each of us as individuals to fail. And the rest of this uh, passage, beginning at verse 14, talks about our spiritual armor that we would put on. I want to remind you in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter describes the devil as going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Well, that's us. He wants to devour us. He wants us to fail as believers, to fail as people of faith. And how do we stand up against him? This is what Paul is talking about as he shares these pieces of armor, beginning at verse 14 and going on through the next several verses. Now, we've already looked at a number of pieces of armor, and I want to get right into the portion that we'll be looking at today. Uh, I'm going to go to verse 15. Paul says this, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then we already talked about the shield of faith from verse 16. And then verse 17, he says, and take the helmet of salvation. I want us to talk about those two things. This having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and taking the helmet of salvation. Well, first of all, I want to talk about this from verse 15, where Paul says we need to have the preparation of the gospel of peace. I think that that phrase is actually more important than even talking about having your feet shod with that. Uh, we know that Paul is using the illustration of the Roman soldier's armor and what he would wear into battle. And so we'll look at that. But but don't fixate on the armor itself. Fixate on the spiritual truths that Paul is talking about here. Well, first of all, what is this? Uh, he's talking about footwear, and the Roman soldier wore a sandal that actually had nails put into it so that they would have a firm grip on what they were walking on. That way they wouldn't be sliding around when they're in battle. You wouldn't want to be fighting hand-to-hand -hand with someone and have your feet slip, and then your enemy could take advantage of that. So they had to wear good, solid shoes that would help them to stand. Well, that's the physical illustration. But what is Paul talking about here? He actually uses the word preparation, the preparation of the gospel of peace. And what's he talking about? I've heard a lot of different people talking about this, and, and many will say it has to be talking about witnessing and sharing the gospel. I don't think that's what he's talking about at all. I think he's talking about your preparation and how you can be prepared to be able to do what he said back here in verse 13, to be able to stand as Satan attacks. So I don't think he's talking about witnessing. And some people would take the word peace and run with that and say that we need to preach to the world that there's peace and, and that uh, mankind would have peace amongst each other. I don't think that's what he's talking about either. I think he's talking about your peace. So let's look at this. I think he's saying that this is your own solid foundation of peace with God. Think about that. It has to do with your salvation. But you can have peace with God. And we'll look at why that can help you to stand firm. But in this case, remember, we were under condemnation. When Adam and Eve sinned and the rest of the human race followed suit with them, we're sinners. And we're under the condemnation of God. And therefore, we were enemies of God. But God created a gospel that would be able to help us no longer be at odds with him. Let me read some verses to you. I want to read in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Paul says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We were under condemnation, but because of the gospel, we have been reconciled to God. We are no longer at odds with God. We have peace with God because of our salvation. We're no longer enemies. Now we're children. We're part of the family. That is the peace that we have with God. And that peace bleeds over into other areas of our life. What that peace does is it makes us settled. We're settled. We're not fearful. As far as our relationship with God, as far as our eternal destiny, as far as, as wondering, um, am I going to get zapped by lightning or, or any of that stuff, we can be settled in our relationship with God and our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And being settled with that makes us settled in the other areas of our life as well. We can now handle the circumstances that are sent our way because we're settled, we're calm about that. Let me, let me share with you an illustration of what I mean by that. I want to go back to the book of Deuteronomy. And as Moses was giving instructions to the Israelites, they were about to go into the promised land and they were going to face literal warfare. And I want you to look at these instructions here. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 20. He says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariots and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall approach and speak to the people. And he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Then the officer shall speak to the people saying, What man is there who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in battle and another man dedicate it. Also, what man is there who has planted a vineyard and has not eaten of it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it. And what man is there who is betrothed to a woman and has not married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man marry her. The officer shall speak further to the people and say, What man is there who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest, his, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. You see, they understood, even back in Israel, that you could not go into battle if you had all these other things on your mind, if you were fearful about, will I be able to go back and enjoy that, that uh, vineyard? Will I be able to go back and enjoy that house? Will I be able to go back and marry that girl? All of those were, were things that could cause the divided attention of a person. And they were saying, let them go, let them go back. And even these who are fearful and worried about these other things, let them go so that it doesn't affect everybody else. Well, I believe that's one of the things that Paul is talking about here when he's talking about us having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have peace with God, and that settles a lot of things in our lives. That makes us able to handle all of the other situations that we're going to come up against because we have that peace with God. Now, that's what it is. How do we use it? How do we use this peace that comes from God? And how can it make us prepared to withstand the onslaught that Satan would bring against us? Well, first of all, it begins with your own salvation. You need to make sure that you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. And if you are doing that, you are prepared. You have the one of the greatest things that can help you withstand anything that Satan has to throw at you. Remember, Christ reconciles you and the Heavenly Father. I, I was looking in a theology book this week about this idea of having peace with God. And one of the books was talking about the uh, concept of reconciliation and how we're reconciled to God. And the whole point that it was trying to make was that it gives us peace peace. We have peace with God. We can be settled. We can be those soldiers that go into battle that, yes, even though you'd be fearful of an actual battle, you can know that you're prepared and you can know that you can stand and actually carry on the fight. 
And that's what Paul is saying you need to have by the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then you need to walk in that peace. You need to be at peace with God. You need to be at peace with your life. Let me share this passage of scripture with you for a moment. This is from the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. And I'd like to begin reading at verse 6. Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, we can be at peace with God and therefore at peace with our circumstances and therefore at peace, even though Satan is hurling his fiery darts at us. We need to walk in that peace. I, I did want to share an interesting thing that Paul does at the end of the book of Romans. At the end of the book of Romans, he is wrapping up his letter to that church there. And he says this in verse uh, 19 and 20. He says, for your obedience has became known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The God of peace. It's almost funny to see that word peace used in the same sentence with him crushing an enemy, but the peace is for us because he's doing the fighting for us, and that enemy has no source of victory over us. We can rest in God's peace. Now, the two pieces of armor that I'm looking at today, first of all, we're looking at this preparation of the gospel of peace. That's a state of peace that we can find ourselves in. The next piece of armor, we're going to be talking about the helmet of salvation, I believe is an attitude, an attitude of security. So let's go to that. I'm back in Ephesians chapter 6, and I'd like to read the first part of verse 17. He says, and take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. Well, what's he talking about? Well, first of all, it is a helmet. So it's talking about head protection. And we know how important it is to protect our heads. Uh, today, we wear more helmets than we ever have, right? We, we wear them when we're riding our bikes. We wear them if we were to go rollerblading or roller skating. I don't know if many people do that anymore. But we know that head protection is important. We want our kids, our grandkids to be protected because... All of us know of someone from our past that fell and hit their heads and suffered severe injuries because of it, especially when you get into the mental cognitive type of injuries that hamper people and uh, make their life more difficult. Well, the Roman soldier wore a helmet as well. Now, what did that do? Yes, it protected his head, but I believe it did another thing. It gave him a, a confidence, a confidence to move forward because even though things were flying at them, you knew if you got hit in the head, you were still going to be okay, probably, because you had that helmet on. And, and it, it gives you the ability to continue to fight. It gives you the ability to use your thinking processes and so forth uh, and not have to just worry about keeping your hand over your head all the time. You have your arms free to be able to use your other weapons. Well, I believe that this helmet gives confidence and it gives you a willingness to continue so that you can keep moving forward. Now, just think about this. I believe that this is talking about security. It, it helps you to feel secure. Now, he calls it the helmet of salvation, but he's not talking about getting saved. Because at this point, if you are a Christian wearing the armor of God, you're already saved. I think that's an important uh, part to keep in mind there. It's not about getting saved. You're already saved. But your salvation, the fact that you know you are saved, it provides you a greater source of protection against Satan as he continues to attack. It's security because you know you're saved. Let me read this passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 where Paul mentions the armor again. But look at what he says here in verse 8 through 10. He says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. You see, while Paul said in Ephesians, the helmet of salvation, here I believe Paul is even a little more specific, the hope of salvation, the helmet of the hope of salvation. Well, 
what is hope? Well, first of all, hope isn't something where you're sitting around going, boy, I, I hope that happens. I, I, I hope this happens. In the scriptures, they use it as a firm assurance that something's going to happen, but it's still future. That's, therefore, it's not realized yet, but you know it's coming. It's future. That's why they use the word hope. But I want you to look at the next couple verses that follow right after he mentions the helmet of the hope of salvation. He said, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. What he's saying is, is you should put on the helmet of the hope of salvation because you know your salvation is secure. And you need to live in that hope. You need to go forward in that hope. And it should help you to not have to worry about those things. Look at what he said here. We are not appointed to wrath, but rather God has appointed us to salvation. And we rest in that because of what God has done. Now, it brings up the idea of the, the theological topic of eternal security, or some people would refer to it as the permanence uh, or the perseverance of the saints. Now, even when the saints persevere, it's because God does the work. So we're talking about God's work causing this to happen, but it's eternal security. We in Heritage believe that once you are truly born again, you cannot lose your salvation. Now, I know that there's passages in Scripture that talk about the idea of uh, certain types of sinners not going to heaven, but we'll look at that in just a second because we don't believe that a true believer is going to get caught up in those, not in a permanent sense, but rather a true believer uh, will still be called of God to walk with God, and God may have to discipline him. He may have to deal with him in other ways, but God is going to help him work through those particular things. I remember in my young Christian life, one of the biggest struggles I had was being sure of my salvation. I mean, I knew that I was trusting in Jesus for salvation. I knew that I wasn't trying to earn my way to heaven. I knew that I wasn't doing a lot of religious things in order to go to heaven. I knew that it was because Jesus died on the cross and paid for my sins. But it took me a while to be fully sure of that. And I'll tell you, in the interim time period before I became fully sure, I was hampered in my Christian life. I was always full of guilt because I was still a sinner, even though God had changed my life and had, had gotten rid of a lot of sins in my life. There were other sins that I was finding that were there, and I felt guilty about it. And what's more, Satan wanted me to feel guilty about it, and he wanted me to press me down. And while I was putting so much energy into uh, worrying about that, I couldn't do anything else for the Lord. Until finally, God brought me to the point to where I could, I could say out loud, I know I'm saved and there's nothing Satan can do about it. And once that battle was over, uh, my life had peace. My life was able to move forward. I was able to do more things for the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, just think about this idea of, of the security of the believers, the, the uh, eternal security that we have. The reason I believe it's eternal is for a number of reasons. First of all, the scriptures show that the Trinity is involved in our eternal security. Just consider these things that the scriptures say that each member of the Trinity do. Now, I'm not going to look at the verses now for the sake of time, but you could look these up and take each one of these words, do a word search on it and see where they are in the scriptures. But first of all, consider the Father's work. The scriptures tell us that the Father has chosen us, the Father has predestined us, and the Father has power to keep us. Consider the Son. The scriptures say that the Son has redeemed us, has justified us, has forgiven us, has sanctified us. He has prayed for us. He advocates for us. He intercedes for us. He's at work all those things in order to make our salvation secure. Consider the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one who regenerated us. That is, he made us new. Uh, he's the one who indwells us. He's the one who seals us. By the way, that's an important thing to look at. When the scriptures are talking about the Holy Spirit sealing us, the whole point is that we're secure forever because he is the seal that, that signifies that. And then it also says that the Holy Spirit uh, baptizes us into the body of Christ. It's the work of the Spirit. The, the work of the Father, the work of the Son, they are the ones that have put us into salvation, and that makes our salvation secure. 
Now, some people might criticize us and say, yeah, you guys believe once saved, always saved. And that means uh, a person, once they make a profession, they can go and do anything they want. Well, no, we don't believe that. We believe, I, I like to say it this way, once saved, proven saved. That, yeah, I might fall into sin, but then God disciplines me and I turn back from it. It's that person who falls into sin and never turns back. They're not being shown to be a child of God because God promises to discipline his children. And if they're not being disciplined and they're not turning back, it's more evidence that their salvation never was genuine in the first place. Not that they lost their salvation. So we would believe the idea once saved, proven saved. Well, how do we use the helmet of salvation then? The security that we have that tells us that no matter what Satan's throwing at us, no matter how he's trying to beat us down, I am a child of God. Well, how do we, how do we use that? Well, first of all, you need to settle the issue. I want to turn to a passage of scripture that helped me to settle it. And uh, this has been important. I remember this from my earliest days of being a Christian, and that's in 1 John chapter 5. In fact, the whole book of 1 John, John is trying to show how you can see the difference between true believers and pretenders, not real believers. And, and he gets up to this in chapter 5, beginning at verse 11. He says, and this is the testimony that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. John wanted them to trust the biblical knowledge they had, the spiritual knowledge they had, rather than doubting that, because Satan wants to push us down, knock us down, and he's saying, no, you can stand because you know that you believe in the Son of God. Now, I want to go back to Ephesians as we finish this up. We're talking about this armor, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, uh, the helmet of salvation. Well, what is the purpose of it all? Why, why, why would this helmet of salvation help us? Well, that's what Paul was getting at when he said this in verse 13, before he went on to the individual pieces of armor. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We need to stand, and, and we stand by incorporating these things that God has given us. Again, don't fixate so much on the physical armor of a soldier, but fixate on the spiritual truth. In this case, the preparation of the gospel of peace. You have peace with God, and therefore you can stand. You can stand firm. You can stand confidently because the dividing wall between you and God is gone. And now you are his son. You have peace with him. You're no longer an enemy. You're a family member. And so you have his peace, but also you are secure in this salvation. You're covered because God has provided for your salvation. God uh, elected you, called you, predestined you. The Lord Jesus redeemed you. The Lord Jesus has, has brought you into the family and the Holy Spirit baptized you into the body of Christ. We are firmly in the body of Christ, and therefore we can stand firm knowing that we are saved and that uh, God is providing what we need so that no matter what Satan throws at us, we can stand. He, he will throw things at us. He doesn't want you to stand. He wants you to fall, wants you to be a failure. Again, he can't take away your salvation, but he can certainly make you not effective, make you go the way of the world instead of the way of walking with God. We can continue to walk with God and withstand whatever he throws at us because of these spiritual truths that God has laid upon us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your work in my life and helping me to be able to stand at times when uh, Satan was trying to tear me down. And uh, thank you that I can stand and be your servant and then see your purposes accomplished because of that. Father, I pray that you'd work in the hearts of all the folks who are listening to me right now so that they can not be uh, cast into uncertainty and into confusion, but rather can stand firm knowing that their salvation is real, knowing that they have peace with you, no matter what Satan says, and knowing that their salvation is secure, no matter what Satan says. Bless them, Father. Help us all to walk with you and to be the army that you have uh, left us here to be. Thank you, Lord. I pray in this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Let's sing one more song together, Like a River Glorious. 